Hello, Max. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. Uh, so we're going to discuss your latest book, uh, Revenge Capitalism, uh, which uh, actually the longer title, uh, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. Uh, so you're kind of in a, a chair of research uh, in culture, media and social justice at Lakelands University in Canada. Uh, your books include uh, Art After Money, Money After Art, uh, Crisis of Imagination, Crisis of Power, Cultures of Financialization, and The Radical Imagination. And uh, I suppose after the three books I've read uh, is Art uh, After Money, Money After Art, and Radical Imagination, uh, which um, they're both equally good, but they're both different to this book, <laughs> uh, Revenge Capitalism. And uh, I think we're going to explore, I suppose, what those differences are. And I'm sure you'll, you, you will elucidate uh, as we go along. And so I'm just going to just give an introduction to the book and why we're doing the interview. So Revenge Capitalism, The Ghost of Empire, The Demons of Capital and The Settling of Unpayable Debts is Max Haven's most recent publication to date. Capitalism uh, is in a profound state of crisis beyond the mere dispassionate cruelty of ordinary structural violence. It appears today as a global system bent on reckless economic revenge. Its expression is found in mass incarceration, climate chaos, unpayable debts, pharmaceutical violence and the relentless uh, degradation of common life. Uh, Max Haven argues that this economic vengeance helps us explain the culture and politics of revenge we see in society more broadly, moving from the history of colonialism and its continuing effects today. Uh, you argue uh, the opioid crisis in the US, uh, the growth of surplus populations worldwide, and unpacks the central paradigm of unpayable debts, both as uh, reparations owed and as a methodology of oppression. Uh, so for this conference, uh, I myself, co-director of Furfield, will interview you about this book, discussing how its themes, ideas, and social contexts relate to our own everyday and cultural experiences and what this means. Uh, so Max, my first question is uh, that revenge capitalism feels very different to your other publications. Uh, already there's something about that word revenge, which we will discuss further in the next 45 minutes or so. However, my main question to start with at this point is uh, why you chose to write such a book now? And do you feel that it's different to your other works on the whole? And if so, what is that or it? Mm. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for, for taking the time and for these great questions and, and that great question in particular. Um, I mean, I think when I sat down to write this book, um, it, it began, um, to tell you the truth, uh, at, the, um, at the moment when a neo-Nazi drove uh, his car into protesters in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, killing the anti-fascist um, activist Heather Heyer, and in some ways announcing um, for the whole world to see that a kind of uh, far-right revenge politics had had fully entered the world stage. Um, and I want to qualify that by saying that for many other people around the world, outside of North America, um, that revenge politics had been abundantly clear for a long time. I mean, it had already been clear in the preceding year and a half within North America with the rise of Donald Trump and his sort of vindictive uh, racist campaigning, which now in the time that we're doing this interview in, in June, 2020, we were seeing uh, in full blossom in terms of his response to the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. We saw the, that view of revenge politics in the Brexit referendum, for instance, in the UK, we saw it with the rise of Orban in Hungary, Modi in India, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and uh, elsewhere 
around the world. So I don't want to particularize the US experience, but I think that moment led me to really want to do a deeper investigation of how politics, how democratic politics generally turns so vindictive and vengeful. And I wanted to respond to um, the kind of uh, precious and pearl clutching surprise of the liberal intelligentsia of, on both sides of the Atlantic that seemed to say the rise of revenge politics is surprising. Whereas the argument I make in the book is ultimately revenge politics is the natural and logical outcome of a kind of economic revenge that's being wreaked by capitalism, first and foremost in our moment of financialization, which is kind of takes place in the same historical and seen as corporate-led globalization and neoliberalism since the 1970s. But in fact, if we look at the history of capitalism more broadly, we'll see that it has been vengeful and it has depended on the um, articulations of political revenge since its very origins in 1492, beginning with the vindictive voyage of Columbus across the ocean and the incredible violence that has been unleashed by European imperialism ever since. Um, so in that sense, the book is a very historical, it's very contemporary, it's about our moment, but it's also, for me, it was a forensic uh, investigation of what led to our moment. Uh, in that sense, it is a bit different than my other books, uh, but still within a similar thematic, which is that all everything I've written and my whole, um, my whole ambition over my, my academic career has been to study the power of the imagination. Um, and on one sense, I've studied that in terms of the power of social movements of radical artists uh, in order to see how they activate the radical imagination, how they create a space where some other thing might emerge into the world to make other worlds possible and thinkable. But on the other hand, I've been interested over the last few years in um, the, the dependence of capitalism as a system on imagination, on harnessing and activating our imaginations so that you can have something like the financial sector, which basically runs on completely imaginary money. And yet that imaginary money has incredible power over life, work, food, housing all over the world. Um, and I've been, I've been trying to figure out how it is that the imagination has so much power. And if, if it has so much power in this moment to really create a world uh, out of these imaginary assets, to what other ends could the imagination be put? Um, and that interest still carries over into revenge capitalism. Uh, part of the investigation of the book is trying to figure out how it is that you can have a system that's so vengeful and violent without anyone necessarily intending it to be vengeful or violent. Uh, and how it conscripts, in some ways, all of us into reproducing that system of vengeance and violence. Okay, so before the next question, I can pull something out of what you just said there. So, so uh, uh, beyond the mere dispassionate cruelty of ordinary structural violence, which is how we traditionally see it as, uh, there's a kind of emotionally systemic revenge, almost, where the, we have networked versions, neoliberal versions, uh, and uh, and so we have a kind of uh, and the various sets of values are based on those uh, systemic approaches around revenge and violence and and stuff like that. Would you say that's you know that that's part of the methodology? Yeah, the, the methodology is a bit is a bit counterintuitive in the book, but I think I think you're capturing it there. There's there's two at least two layers of the revenge yeah. of capitalism. On the one hand, there's the what we would kind of expect, which is that well, let, actually, let's say three layers. So on one level, we know from the history of capitalism that it's always relied on the reckless, sadistic vengeance of the ruling classes and racial elites uh, to maintain order. So this looks like the suppression of strikes of working people. It looks at the kind of like the really horrific violence enacted in colonies. And that includes uh, not only direct military violence, but also the violence of indifference, like when the British empire allowed millions of Bengali people to starve to death in 1943 under Winston Churchill. Um, you know, I, Churchill was a racist, but he didn't necessarily you know, and he made a choice to do that, but it wasn't necessarily something that, you know, like his, his modus operandi to do it. It was part of the vengefulness that had been a part of the British Empire since its onset of which he was a, which he was an agent and an operative. So on the one hand, we have these forms of vengeance that are sort of direct. On the second hand, 
we have the kind of indirect vengeance that nobody necessarily intends. And so this might include like the vengeance of climate change. Nobody necessarily intends for, uh, to put two to four billion people in the world at risk of starvation, displacement or death because we've decided to um, secure and defend the profits of a handful of fossil fuel corporations. Nobody actually like came together and like cackled in a back room or were like, yes, we're gonna do this. The vengeance emerges on those people um, around the world, those two to four billion people, emerges from the internal and inherent logic of the system. So what I'm really striving to find in the book is the way that the system takes revenge, though it's not necessarily the intention of any individual, and certainly it's not the intention of a system because the system itself can't, can't take revenge. And then third, I'm trying to understand how the being in a context of a world that is created and shaped by revenge, the revenge of capitalism, a revenge politics then is bred um, as people respond to it often in very bad ways. So you find the rise of new ethno-nationalisms, new religious fundamentalisms, new forms of reactionary politics that have this character of being vengeful. And they are responses to the vengefulness of capitalism, but they're in fact terrible responses that, in, that really just reproduce the system rather than in any way challenge it. Okay, so, uh, so in your introduction, you say, I'm interested in what it might mean to face our fear of revenge head on and ask what would it mean today in the face of the rise of reactionary revenge fantasies to cultivate an avenging imaginary as a revolutionary force? So uh, uh, could you offer us a short and perhaps a general summary of what this looks like in respect of how it has been uh, presented in your book? Sure, I think it makes most sense when compared to what I'm arguing against, which I term in the book reconciliophilia. Uh, and by that, I mean the, the strange way we've come to obsess, especially over the last 30 or 40 years, with the idea of forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, now, the, the example that's closest to my heart is here in my home country of Canada. Um, there's been an ongoing effort uh, through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the initiatives of, a, of the current uh, government to reconcile with indigenous people, which is to say uh, atone for the crimes of genocide that have been committed against indigenous people, specifically in the residential school system, which essentially was a policy of the in part of the 19th and 20th century to seize indigenous children from their family and re-educate them in, um, in state and church run schools that were extremely abusive, um, both culturally, but also to the individual children as well in terms of physical and sexual abuse. Um, so there's been a kind of atonement for that, and the government has uh, here has really pushed the idea that this is going to solve the problem um, of, of Indigenous people and that we're on the road to reconciliation. But it, 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 this approach then tries to sweep under the rug the continuance of the kind of vengeful colonialism that Indigenous people have faced in Canada since its founding as a British and French colony uh, many centuries ago, in the sense that the, the Canadian nation state still depends on resource extractive industries that require the seizure of indigenous land. Indigenous people still suffer incredibly horrific uh, indicators in terms of mortality from preventable causes, in terms of police abuse, in terms of health and welfare. Um, so ultimately, the, there is a, on the surface, there's an insistence on reconciliation. Underneath that, there's the continuation of revenge. And I see this pattern as continuing all over the place that we have a kind of obsession with, with peace, with reconciliation, a lot of which gets projected onto certain beatified figures like Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and Nelson Mandela um, that we sort of fetishize or romanticize, ignoring completely their thought and their work and their life and their context in order to satisfy ourselves that there is some politics out there that uh, is about kind of um, positive affect, positive emotions. And I, I see this kind of uh, reconciliophilia as often self-serving and narcissistic. And in contrast, I want to turn to the way that social movements of the working class, of colonized people, of racialized people, have always had an avenging aspect to them and not to sweep that under the rug, which is always our temptation to say in fact that there has been a sense that these movements have not been vindictive in the sense that they wanna take revenge on particular people, although sometimes that happens, but to say that 
often these movements, if we're honest about them and we want to we want to embrace and think in complexity about their legacy, have said to their participants, there is a debt to be paid to us. We are owed a debt that has not been paid, and that debt is unpayable. Um, and that we are here not only to avenge the crimes and cruelties that have been enacted on us, but to enact the, to, to avenge the crimes and cruelties that have been enacted on our ancestors, literal and metaphoric ancestors. And if we take that as a part of what animates social movements, we can recognize and start to make better distinctions between the kinds of what I call avenging imaginary. And for me, the more successful and more promising avenging imaginaries are ones that say, we don't just want to return the harm that was done to us in the same coin in which it was dealt. We don't just want to revisit on our oppressors the form of oppression they are enacting upon us. Rather, and this is a key theme right now in the uprisings in the United States and elsewhere against uh, the, the devaluation of Black lives, the protesters, the avenging imaginary, what I would call the avenging imaginary of the protesters, is in many cases saying, we want to abolish the system that caused the harm and the revenge in the first place so nobody ever has to suffer it. Um, and I think that's a key pathway towards the radical imagination in that avenging imaginary, which is distinct from what I call a revenge fantasy. Okay, well, that's two of my questions answered there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might go back to them. Uh, so in the first chapter, uh, uh, the title is Toward a Materialistic Theory of Revenge, and you repent, uh, rep, uh, represent an expansive archive of critical theory with examples from popular culture and, uh, and on the rise of, say, revenge projects of Donald Trump uh, to, de to develop a materialistic theory of re revenge. Uh, so uh, by examining uh, this entwined history of colonialism, patriarchy and capitalism, you reframe range as one, uh, on the one hand, something that describes uh, logical systems of domination as well as, and we all heard, remember Trump saying, we must dominate, uh, as well as pervasive political sentiment to which uh, those systems give rise. And so I'm saying, could you highlight some of those examples in relation uh, to the revenge politics of Donald Trump. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think he offers such an incredible example of the articulation of a revenge politics. Um, almost too good an example. And I'm also, <laughs> I also just want to preface any discussion of him by saying that, like, um, if Donald Trump did not exist, then revenge capitalism would have had to invent him because ultimately the service that he does is to particularize and exceptionalize revenge politics uh, in a way that allows many protagonists and proponents of revenge capitalism who are otherwise better behaved and better spoken to hide their own activities. So, you know, you have most of Wall Street crying foul about uh, Donald Trump's revenge politics or what I frame as revenge politics. Uh, and yet, of course, they are the authors of the revenge of the revenge economy that gave rise to him. So there's the caveat in place that if we speak about him, let's 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 see him as a crystallized articulation of some much deeper trend tendencies rather than as the exception. I think everything we need to know about him happened just last week when on a on a telephone call with governors in the United States. Uh, Republican and friendly governors to him, uh, responding to the uprisings in U.S. cities, he instructed them that, to quote, there needs to be retribution uh, for the uprisings. Um, and I think to unpack this, there's one surface meaning here, which is simply that he is an authoritarian. Uh, he believes that law and order needs to rule and that anyone who breaks his definition of law and order, and it's very selective, of course, uh, needs to be punished. And that punishment needs to be public and it needs to be retributive. Um, at least in this sense, he's honest about what so many other politicians hide. And the example I'll give, because it's contextual to the uprisings that are going on now, is the American prison system. There is no way any intelligent person could imagine that the American present system is about anything other than retribution, uh, not for people who've done harm to society, but against black people for being black. That is the modus operandi of the American prison system. It, it is a form of mass incarceration, mostly of black people, 
and mostly for uh, most of the people who are in there are for uh, petty crimes or crimes that were committed out of the experience of poverty. It is the continuation of a system not only of slavery, as has been pointed out by many um, many commentators, it's also a continuation of the forms of anti-Black revenge that were pioneered during slavery and became the norm, especially in the US South after the abolition of slavery, where gangs of white people organized themselves into organizations, including the Ku Klux Klan, to basically take freelance reckless revenge on black people for simply existing. Uh, so ultimately what we're seeing is an uprising against the forms of anti-black revenge that have been the main, uh, the mainstream and the, 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 the systemic basis of the American society and American economy since, uh, since well before abolition, but certainly since abolition, when black people and their allies dare rise up against this form of systemic and structural revenge, Donald Trump then calls up the spirits and the demons of political revenge again. Uh, he's about to make a speech uh, in the next week that's authored by his white supremacist assistant, uh, Stephen Miller, where I think we're going to see precisely, again, this calling out to the spirits of white vengeance and white vengefulness. Um, and I think that gives us a, a very good example of exactly what's happening here. He makes an incredible amount of political capital uh, by, by calling out to these spirits of revenge. But why, why? So one reason is that the United States has been steeped for centuries in anti-Black revenge. And that anti-Black revenge sometimes takes the form of vigilante violence. Sometimes it takes the form of police and prison violence uh, that is systemic and structural and institutional. And sometimes it simply takes the form of an authorless and uh, seemingly um, nonsensical economic revenge against Black people, where the structures of the economy from the subprime loan scandal to its predecessors in, in redlining in American cities um, and various other forms of uh, economic exclusion and exploitation have taken this kind of slow intergenerational revenge on black people. It's, it's on almost other. like, it's almost like, sorry, uh, just yeah. like, just because you can get, it's almost like, because the systems are there already set up, you can get away with it. So why not just do it? It's almost like you don't, you don't actually, you know, if you look on Twitter and you, people are just reacting without thinking and, and, they're kind of retweeting uh, revenge anger mm -hmm. uh, without thinking that they're perpetuating the spirit of revenge and racism, and which is which I think kind of fits quite closely to where you're coming from around that you've got the spirit of it that kind of takes people over, which is a bit like a classical Greek uh, where. Uh, say like spirits used to take people over like rage and love and anger and then it's gone somewhere else and it's 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 a bit it's really strange the thing where mm -hmm. yeah you've got this kind of and we and I think we're getting to realize especially that your book kind of <clears throat> what's so interesting uh the profoundness of it or profundity or whatever it it what it what it kind of reminds us even though we have all this technology and uh, all this kind of uh, belief that we're kind of accelerated into a kind of uh, future state of existence that's beyond primitiveness, we are really still extremely tribal and uh, we're, we're still dominated by kinds of uh, male patriarchal figures whether it's kings and queens or presidents, that right from the beginning of record that we've always been influenced by, and it, it just doesn't stop. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, but I would, you know, I would in, give two qualifications to it. I would say this before you answer, I'll say this in a Murray Bookchin sense. Uh -huh. So carry on, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I think that's a good, a good way of framing it. And I think the thing that I take from Bookchin and other writers of his is, is that, like, we have a responsibility to a, a struggle against authority and authoritarianism that transcends all different social formations, um, and that there is a solidarity throughout human history uh, with those who do struggle against that authoritarian tendency. 
the two qualifications I would give to what you just said, which I think is, is really, really interesting, is that uh, first, I don't necessarily think the thing that you're describing is tribalism. And I think if you look at um, a number of kind of radical anthropologists, one of the things they point out is that in actual tribal societies, um, there are interesting mechanisms by which societies deal with revenge. Um, and one of the examples we might get to talk about later um, is the example of wampum beads in uh, tribal societies, what we would classify a, a bit unfairly as tribal societies in um, Turtle Island, what, or what is now known as North America. Wampum beads before colonization played a very important role in those societies in healing revenge and making sure that revenge didn't run away with individuals and didn't run away with society. The second thing I would say is, I think that there's a huge element of truth to the idea that revenge and the, the kind of manipulation of revenge by powerful figures has always been with us as human beings. But I think that that's what revenge means changes in every society. And it changes in part because those precisely those powerful figures define what revenge means for us. And one of the arguments in the book is that in, in all of these societies, but especially in capitalism, the powerful seek to define the exercise of their power, even when it's purely vengeful, as justice, as necessity, as economic normalcy. And the, you know, the example of the American prison system is, is another good one. That is defined as the exercise of impartial justice. It's defined as the locking up of bad guys, blah, 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 blah. In fact, it's revenge. And you know, colonialism is another great example. When the colonists arrived in a place, th what they saw and how they framed the indigenous people they met was as pathologically vengeful, semi-evolved, uh, partial humans. And while the colonial system took constant and unrelenting revenge on colonized people, it was presented as justice, as normalcy, as law. So there's a way that in every historical epoch in every society, uh, the, the system of power that takes revenge and excites revenge hides its own revenge and projects its, the, 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 the slur of revenge and vengefulness onto its others upon whom it's taking revenge. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> in the first chapter again, uh, you say uh, to face these, uh, I'm just trying to go back here, to face head on, uh, I, I would say like the materialist theory of revenge and uh, we will need to let go of our allergy of thinking seriously about revenge. So, and are you saying that knowledge and ideas about revenge need to be examined more deeply and critically? And which, of, which is obvious you are. But uh, in a say, if so, in what contexts, you know, beyond, maybe beyond academia, where would you think that those need to exist? Or they, yeah, those, something needs to exist in that. What, what does that look like? I feel that on a, on a sociological and anthropological level, um, as, I, as I was just discussing in my, in, in my response to the idea of tribalism, I think every society and every subculture in some ways of societies finds its own ways of transmuting vengeful feeling into generative um, uh, political change, uh, if they're gonna be successful. So first and foremost, I would say that the, one of the big problems with many struggles for justice in the world is that, especially in this day and age, partly because of the legacies of, of um, Christian scripture, we have, a, we have this allergy to even talking about revenge. It's like, if you feel vengeful, then there's something wrong with you. Whereas of course, I would say, if you feel vengeful in this moment, then th like that is a natural response to a system that is taking revenge on all of us in differential ways with differential consequences. Um, so first and foremost, let's be honest about the, the, the feelings that we're feeling and let's develop a better language and better theories for understanding those feelings. And second of all, uh, my, my sense is that we need to then think very carefully and, and work with our historical archives and our traditions to think about how we can transmute um, the feeling of vengeance, which has a lot to do with trying to return the harm that was done to us on others to transmute that feeling of vengeance into a movement for avenging, what I call a movement for avenging. Um, and that doesn't mean giving up on the vengefulness. It simply means recognizing that if that vengefulness 
is going to be put to a use that actually ends these cycles of violence and retribution, um, we are going to need to transmute it into something capable of taking vengeance not on individuals, but on systems. Um, and it's one of, the, one of the great successes of right-wing or reactionary um, uh, revenge uh, sentiment and revenge politics is that it does the opposite. It says, don't focus on the system. The, si the system doesn't matter. Take, look at individuals or look at groups of individuals and take revenge on them instead. And so it offers a kind of cold comfort yeah, um, and then, as revenge often does. And obviously they've got lots of right-wing newspapers that are happy to just pick on individuals as part of their weaponry. Absolutely. Uh, and it's very lucrative for newspapers and media. Yes, I mean, phew, yes. It's, uh, and for Hollywood too. Yeah, yeah, it just all fits together and you, you've got influencers and it just all... Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to, I want to discuss a little bit more around uh, revenge around some of the black demonstrations that have been happening because I'm I've halved the question because you 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 uh, and so this week uh, as part of like kind of uh, Black Lives Matter protests in the UK uh, in response to uh, George Floyd you know being murdered by. Uh, Derek uh, Chauvin and his peers, uh, police peers. Uh, the statue of Edward Colston, uh, the English merchant of the Tory member of, and Tory member of parliament uh, who was involved in the slave trade around 1672 was toppled in Bristol, one of my old places I used to live in. It's a very good place as well. Uh, on the 7th of June, uh, it was rolled down the street and then thrown into the harbor uh, by Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, uh, and the successful toppling of Colston has, has encouraged attention to other sculpt statues uh, of slave traders, uh, such as Cecil Rhodes uh, in Oxford University. And that's kind of teetering. It's not quite been knocked off its pedestal just yet, mm -hmm. its colonial pedestal. Uh, and so, so the moment we're, we, we're, we're having a kind of uh, debate online, everyone's discussing it. it's in the news at the moment. It's, uh, it's a very interesting stage in the kinds of Black Lives Matter uh, kinds of critique of, its, of our kinds of uh, colonial histories. And, um, and it's also a chance for, like Bristol's got a very strong uh, black and working class culture, and and not just that, it's quite educated. Uh, for and so it knows its it knows its history. It knows why it's doing it. It's not just doing it uh, for the sake of it. And so so you're going to get these different elements of people that kind of are not just reacting because they think they should react. They're reacting uh, because they're using the moment to express their dissatisfaction of the hierarchies that are dominant their own uh, narratives and cultures, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm saying, what kind of revenge do you see this as being? Mm. And how does it connect up with re revenge capitalism? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because it's it's, this has happened after you've written the book. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting to see how you can relate it uh, in that context. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think maybe there's, there's three parts to this question. So the first, the first part I would say is that, um, I mean, Bristol was built on the slave trade. Um, that's the reason why the city basically exists as a, as a city, as a port. Um, so it's important to recognize that the entire architecture of that city, uh, of which that statue is a piece, uh, really comes from a history of revenge, uh, because I would frame the history of the transatlantic slave trade and the slavery economy of the Caribbean and other British holdings in, in the Americas as one that was based fundamentally on revenge. I mean, if you pay, you know, if you, if you read the accounts of slaveholders themselves and slave traders themselves, they're quite honest about the fact that they take preemptive, uh, revenge on enslaved people all the time. Um, the most horrific acts that humans are capable of were normalized 
and excused away in one hand as as being fine because these people in their in the view of the slaveholders were not human but also interestingly because the history of slavery and racism uh, in the uk and elsewhere has always been based on the idea and the fear of the revenge of the enslaved and so the slaveholders would take this kind of needless warrantless constant revenge on enslaved people because they said if they didn't take that revenge preemptively then the slaves would take revenge on them there's an element of truth to that. The slaves certainly had every right to take every revenge on their slaveholders, uh, as happened, for instance, in the Haitian Revolution and re uh, revolutions that occurred, in, for instance, against the British uh, slave systems in Jamaica and elsewhere. Um, so on the one hand, I would just want to frame the origins of capitalism, the origins of Bristol in this kind of revenge system. The second point I would make is that the continuation of insisting on maintaining these statues uh, in the face of that horrific history. And then the, the gall of saying that it's about preserving history, while at the same time it hides the history of revenge, is itself a form of revenge. It's a, piece, it's a form of revenge on all the black and racialized and working class people of Bristol, that the, every day they have to look at a statue whose history of revenge is hidden, right? And so then when people actually tear it down, of course the response, from the inheritors of empire. And let's be clear about who they are, the, the sort of right-wing press, the inheritors of empire and the inheritors of revenge capitalism. Their response has been to say, oh, this crowd is recklessly, bestially vengeful, that all they care about are these kind of petty acts of vengeance against a statue. Aren't they stupid? Aren't they subhuman? It participates and perpetuates exactly the same underlying narrative as the slaveholders had the whole time, which is that the crowd the racialized other, the colonized other, the enslaved other is a subhuman incapable of any more complex political thought than simply reaction and revenge. And it is therefore justified, it was justified during slavery to use preemptive revenge against them. And it is justified now to use police violence against them. So the cycle of revenge is here. Whereas, just to close, I think that the daring down of statues is resonant with this kind of avenging imaginary. I think it's part of a system that says, you know, this is an unacceptable way of punctuating public space with these horrific monuments to death and destruction. And, you know, I think um, ultimately there's a sense here that, you know, in the book, I, I, I come to this formulation that an avenging imaginary flows from the conviction that what you love has value in a world where it is rendered worthless. And the tearing down of this statue is an act of love for black life and for the idea that as communities that involve multiple different sorts of people, we could live and transcend the histories of violence that have been used to tear us apart. Okay, so uh, in uh, chapter three, uh, where, uh, which is titled uh, Money as a Medium of Vengeance, Colonial Accum uh, Accumulation and Proletarian Practices, uh, in it, you seek to demonstrate that in spite of the claims of neoliberal theorists who frame capitalist money as a singular social technology of peace, it can fruitfully be understood as a medium of systemic and structural violence and uh, re, revanchism. Re, re, what is that? Re revanchism, yeah. Yes, what is that? I've never used that word before. It's an interesting word. It, uh, I mean, it basically means a politics based on revenge, but it originally comes from uh, the French, uh, and it referred to the kind of desires of the the French, the kind of hegemonic desires of the French state to reclaim Alsace uh, from the Germans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then it's also been used to describe the feelings. It fruitfully described the feelings of uh, the U.S. Southern quote unquote rebel states. Uh, for the lo loss of the Civil War. So it describes a kind of political uh, form of revenge. I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, so I have my own immediate examples such as neo-colonialism uh, and cultural imperialism. But of course, it would be great to hear your own examples from this chapter where you discuss mm -hmm. early history as, correct me if I'm wrong, a vindictive form of monetary colonization, which you, you've, you have uh, kind of unpacked some of that. I would also, uh, yes, so I have another question to get to that, but I think if you can ask that quickly in a clear way, I don't know how long we've got, so. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but uh, I think, uh, yes, if we just touch on that, especially in regard to neo-colonialism and cultural pillars, which we kind of touched upon all the way through, really, but in a monetary sense, I think that would be good. So I want to preface this discussion of, of money to say that I wrote this chapter. It originally appeared um, in, in the, um, a collection from the Institute for Network Cultures um, on, oh, yeah, on the Money yeah. Lab collection, uh, or parts of it originally did. And it was written in some ways as a bit of a warning to many friends uh, for, that we both have in common, I think, uh, not individual people, but a kind of tendency in the, in the kind of cryptocurrency um, and monetary innovation community, um, which I think there's an enthusiasm that if only we could sort of fix the monetary system, then we would fix all other systems, like a kind of chiropractic maneuver where if you just like align the spine of society, which here is seen as the money system, everything's gonna kind of work out and be better. And my sense is that, uh, that of course, there's a um, great importance to explore new ways we can cooperate with one another and new media for cooperation, including new forms of money and quantification of labor and of value. But I think that there is a bit of a problem in the way that people historicize the story of money because it they tend to take up um, uh, a story of money from uh, liberal eco economic thinkers like Adam Smith that come to us from Adam Smith that is, I think, fundamentally wrong. Now, just briefly, that story from Adam Smith is that there's a kind of trans historical story of money and humans specialize in their form of labor. They uh, develop specialized goods and services. They bring them to a proverbial market. At the market, they're all bartering their goods and services. And then one day some smart person comes up and says, actually, what if we just use one of these commodities to exchange all other commodities rather than you know, me trying to trade like five cows for 10 uh, bushels of wheat? Why don't I trade my, ten, my, my three cows for $10, this thing we're gonna call a dollar, and then I use that dollar to buy the wheat and everything becomes simpler and voila, you have a system that unfolds from that. And you have you know, imperial philosophers like Niall Ferguson and his Ascent of Money who sort of take up this story whole cloth and then retell human history essentially as the kind of peaceful progress of money uh, that then finally uh, leads us to what Francis Fukuyama called the end of history. You know, a moment where capitalism takes over the world and everything's exchangeable in money and we have a kind of universal peace. This is nonsense. Um, it's nonsense historically, it's nonsense anthropologically, and it's nonsense in the terms of political economy. And so I want to go back and tell a different story of money in this chapter. And I choose the, there are many examples like this, uh, but I choose the one that happened on the territories that I currently inhabit here in Canada, uh, which is the story of wampum beads. Now, I'm going to try and tell this very, very quickly, uh, <laughs> but it'll do a lot of injustice to the complexities. So essentially wampum beads are purple and white shell beads that were harvested in the area that's now known as Connecticut and New York State on the coastline. And these beads were traded inland before colonialism here in Turtle Island amongst many, many different indigenous nations. And the, the, the reach of wampum beads as a trade commodity in that age speaks to the complexity of these civilizations and the complexity of their trade and diplomatic relationships. And as it spread throughout North America before colonization, um, wampum became useful for people, not only as a medium to trade things in as a commodity uh, and a currency, it also became very important spiritually and politically. So treaties on these lands between different indigenous nations were signed in wampum through the exchange of wampum uh, and also through creating belts of wampum that had very specific purposes. Uh, it was used in funerary rites by a number of indigenous nations. And importantly, it was used as a means, uh, if you owed someone a blood debt, if there was, if you had killed a member of their family or you'd done a harm to them, you would give wampum as a way of, of, of atoning for your debt. And that would heal the society of revenge. So wampum was this very important social technology, not only of trade, but also of, uh, ameliorating the socially destructive effects of vengefulness. When the Europeans arrived, at first they thought wampum was just use, a useless trinket. There's stories of, for instance, um, uh, the Dutch buying Manhattan Island for wampum beads, uh, which is of course a complete, it, it, it is, it's highly mythologized uh, because they weren't buying it, they were essentially renting use of it, but then they decided that they bought it. But the real story I try and tell in the chapter is when a Dutch trader kidnapped a, a, an indigenous uh, leader named Tabotem 
and essentially demanded ransom in the form of furs, which is what the Europeans wanted on these shores. When the um, when Tabotem's people, the, the Pequot, uh, said that they didn't have those furs because it wasn't the right season to hunt them, and in any case, the ransom was impossible to obtain, uh, the the trader whose name was Van Elikens killed Tabotem, uh, but he also got the ransom that the Pequot offered, which was a huge, like a, a king's ransom worth of wampum beads. And uh, Elikens and other European uh, Dutch traders at the time realized that they could use this uh, huge. Uh, primitive accumulation of wampum beads now to destroy indigenous economies. So what they began to do is demand that all fur trade happen in wampum beads. And they began to declare that wampum would be legal tender. And as their power grew, they began to demand that indigenous people start paying them fines and taxes in wampum. And meanwhile, they began to dominate and, uh, and control the areas where wampum shells were actually cultivated and produced such that by, you know, within 20 years, within one generation, indigenous people had no sources to produce wampum and yet had to constantly pay through wampum. And it was a means not only of genocide and the colonization of indigenous lands, but also what I call econocide, the whole destruction of a much more complex, much more prosaic, much more profound economy that indigenous people were practicing before colonization. And I think this story of the origin of money does us much better service in understanding the, the perils and promises of money than the kind of bucolic just so story that we inherit from Adam Smith and that gets pr propagated by sort of defenders of the neoliberal order. And I think it does much better service to those of us who would like to think about what other purposes money could be put towards in a sort of better world. Uh, and we have to contend with, with the way that money has been used in the history of capitalist vengeance uh, rather than narrating it as a techno as a, as a perfecting and perfectible technology of peace. Okay, <clears throat> that's clear. So, yeah. uh oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, how can I come to a finish? Uh, okay, well, I was gonna, uh, in the postscript after uh, the pandemic against vindictive normal, which you've written towards the end of, of your book, uh, where you say, uh, you write about COVID-19 pandemic, where you say that it's an epochal shift. And in it, you mentioned that there is a, the dangerous blurring of the line between humanitarian and authoritarian measures. You discuss geopolitical weaponization of the pandemic, uh, saying, when we emerge from hibernation, it will be time of unprecedented global struggle uh, against both the drive to return to normal, uh, the same normal uh, that set the stage for this tragedy, and uh, the normal which might be even worse. Let us, and you say, let us prepare as best we can, for we have a world to win. And uh, yes, so uh, there's more, but I think. We'll stick to that and it'll be nice to see how, well, not nice, but interesting to know uh, where you're coming from regarding the kind of context of revenge capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think without, without going into too much detail, we're already seeing um, the, the post-pandemic struggles emerging uh, in the, in the uh, resurgence of Black Lives Matter and the uprisings in the US and their resonance around the world. Um, and I think what is underneath those and why they've gained so much traction, not only amongst black people, but also all, all people, people of many, many different backgrounds is because in them, there is a sense of a refusal of the system of revenge capitalism, which, you know, historically both around the world and specifically in the United States has in its worst manifestations targeted black people. And so solidarity with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and their current uprisings, I think speaks to a much, first of all, solidarity with people who are uh, being murdered by police um, and other systems of injustice, but also to a much deeper refusal of that system's implications for all of us, which to put it very briefly is like revenge capitalism is a system that makes everyone replaceable and worthless uh, in the name of profit. It makes some people much more disposable and worthless than others, 
Um, but it is one that essentially sees human life as a resource to be exploited. Um, and I think everyone feels that touching their life implicitly. Um, some people see the best response to that to be to form together in uh, like ethno-nationalist or religious clusters and try and defend themselves through borders, through militarized force, through the deepening of inequalities. And I think that's the spirit that animates um, the kind of rhetoric of Trump and many, many others, um, you know, far right governments around the world. For many of the rest of us, uh, I think it's leading to a realization that unless we band together in solidarity and create a world where human life and all forms of life on the planet, not just human life, uh, are invaluable rather than worthless and disposable, then uh, we, this system will slowly kill us all um, and might kill some of us much more quickly than others. But I think that's the realization that people are having, even if they can't articulate it as such. And so it's time not only to abolish that system, but to kind of avenge all of the crimes and cruelties that system has done over the ages by annihilating it. Okay, Max, so I think I'm just going to round this up and I really wanted to talk to you about V's Vendetta or Joker's Retribution, <laughs> which I highly recommend because uh, I really understand where you're coming uh, from regarding that context. But we, another time we can have uh, uh, more discussion on this. It's all really interesting and thank you very much. Thanks so much for these great questions. Thank you. Okay, Max, so, uh, so related to the end of chapter four uh, is the interlude and it's called V's Vendetta or Joker's Retribution. Uh, it's a fascinating read where you say both V for Vendetta and Joker are means by which Hollywood for all its contradictions as a capitalist industry, both processes and co-ops, social movements, uh, symbolism, but at the same time provide semiotic and narrative resources for popular mobilization. You link both as coming from a hegemonic masculinity. And so I'm saying, could you discuss what key points you think are poignant in respect of how it all links to revenge, vengeance, class, and racism? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew from the very beginning of working on this book that I wanted to somehow work with V for Vendetta. Um, as a film. And then as I was writing the book, of course, uh, Joker was produced and there was a lot of controversy with its release. And then it became a huge, a huge hit and, and in some ways a touchstone. And what fascinated me about both films is that they obviously take from and seek to re sort of represent in Hollywoodized form um, the culture of street protest uh, of the days in which they were produced. V for Vendetta was produced in um, the early 2000s, sort of during the great uprisings against the Iraq war. And of course, Joker was produced in sort of the wake of uh, the Occupy movement and uh, the Black Lives Matter movements and uh, movements, sort of street protests around the world. Um, and of course, the sort of great global recession and post-crisis post moment after 2008. Um, and so I try and analyze these on a number of different levels. One of them is that there's a strange way that, I mean, a, a, a simplistic reading would simply say that these films uh, take up and commercialize protest culture. And I think there's an element of truth to that. That's what Hollywood does. Uh, both films, I think, are purposefully ambiguous uh, in the lines between what is a kind of right-wing and left-wing vision in order to appeal to very wide audiences for commercial reasons. And yet at the same time, both films then gave resources to social movements, uh, semiotic resources for protest. So for years now, the, the Guy Fox mask that's so iconic from V for Vendetta has been a mainstay of, of protest, especially the Occupy movement or the Hong Kong uh, protest movements, uh, especially where people need to hide their faces. Uh, it began with the hacker group Anonymous and has continued since then. And then immediately following the release of Joker, in uprisings in, um, in Hong Kong, in Chile, uh, in, um, in Lebanon and elsewhere, we began to see people uh, masking themselves up as with the makeup of Joker 
uh, in some way perhaps echoing the film's sort of implicit critique of human abandonment. And for those who haven't seen it, the recent Joker film focuses on a mentally ill, poor white man living in Gotham City, which is a proxy for New York City in the sort of neoliberal moment of the late 70s and early 80s, uh, who is sort of ground down by the society in which he lives uh, to the point where he becomes this kind of uh, psychopathic uh, but charismatic uh, figure. And throughout the entire film, we're never sure if it's his own fantasy or the reality. Um, a fascinating you know, film. Yeah. Can I just cut in just from yeah. the, the, what's interesting about the film, which you actually refer to in the book, is the clash between white class, work class and black culture. Yeah. Uh, specifically, the woman who he idolised in across the hallway, uh, the, the tensions and another black woman, which I can't quite remember yes. in the film that you the, mentioned. The three, well. Yeah. So yeah. one of the arguments I make in the in the book and that others have also noted is that while the overarching narrative of Joker is that American society fails an honest and good white man, uh, the face of America's failure is consistently in that film, black women. Um, so you have in an early scene in the film, a black woman on a bus who distrusts him when he's trying to speak to her child. Uh, and he's presented as kind of childlike, and 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 this is a barrier. There's a there's a scene with his psychologist or social worker where she is not really she's not sympathetic to him. She says like we're all being sh like trashed by this system. There's at the end of the film he murders or or fantasizes about murdering um, a, a sort of forensic psychologist who's interviewing him in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, and then there's his neighbor about whom, who's a black woman, about whom he fantasizes this sort of loving and caring relationship. And it occurs later in the film that in fact, they never had a relationship. She doesn't even know who he is. Um, so throughout the film, it is, it is the failure of black women to care for a white man that leads to the catastrophe and the apocalypse that Joker then unleashes, which you know, is a very reactionary fantasy, right? Because I think what it, it would say to what it says to certain audiences who see the film is that, oh, isn't this terrible neoliberalism seems to be trashing all of us. What it says to other audiences is there have been these special interest groups that are personified in the racist imaginary of the United States as black women who have been elevated to positions of minor authority by an unequal system of opportunities that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, that, that elevate Black women to positions where they ought not to be, and that the failure of Black women to provide enough care is the reason why the system is failing. Even though the film does present then someone like uh, the Wayne family, Batman's family of rich sort of patricians as being somewhat indifferent, really when it comes to the emotional gut punch of the film, the effect comes through these, what are presented as failures of Black women to care for white men. And I think that's an extremely dangerous mythology, but the film is very crafty in that it gives resources to all viewers is, is a sort of Rorschach where you can see whatever you wanna see in it. Uh, but unfortunately, I think when we view films like this, we need to not see what we wanna see. We need to see what we think others will want to see in the film. Um, and I, I think that is especially important in this moment of revenge capitalism and what kind of revenge fantasies these films awaken. You know, similarly, a film like V for Vendetta, uh, you know, it has been interpreted by most, uh, by most people as a kind of liberal democratic or even anarchist uh, approach. And I, I love the film. I think it's a great film. I think the comic book's even better by, uh, by uh, Moore from the 1980s. Um, but there's a way that a lot of these films play both sides of the room or multiple sides of the room. And we need to be very careful about celebrating them too, too quickly. Uh and Viva Vendetta, I think, is is better in the sense that uh, the hero isn't just the main guy. He he kind of trains the other woman to be uh, a kind of anarchist against the state as well. Yes, and, although, uh, although he trains I know, her he, I, I would, psychological yeah, we, and physical abuse. We, we both wouldn't <laughs> recommend the uh, training sequence, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although some people do pay for it, but uh, yeah. you know, it's, we just wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah, so the hegemonic masculinity uh, is quite an interesting aspect. Uh, and 
what I think what I like about the Joker is that uh, he's he's definitely not a superhero. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a dysfunctional person that's got uh, kind of uh, mental health issues, as well as uh, he something about his laugh. You know, he can't. What happens about his laugh? He can't. He he can't control it. It's 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 yeah. like his response to any sort of emotional overwhelm. Yeah, he just starts Which, to kind of hysterical uh, laugh. And the iron, irony of that is really powerful. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, so uh, I think um, going back to the, uh, I think it's Alan Moore. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, when I was younger, I used to read Crisis magazine, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, or Crisis, sorry, Crisis comic, which Alan Moore was part of that, and it was a comic for activists, and uh, and I think V for Vendetta was in there, but also other ones were eco activists. Eco activism of the 80s was being written uh, by that group of writers and uh, artists, and it's very influential in the UK mm. as part of a kind of not just activist movement but also permacultural movements mm. uh, where where you kind of explore alternative ways of existence beyond. Uh, typical kind of absolute hierarchical capitalist means, mm. and uh, and it's very ahead of its time regarding um, around gender and, mm -hmm. and sexism. It was just really interesting, mm -hmm. and, and it's talking to an audience of activists who say at that time would be uh, maybe a bit later protesting against apartheid in South right. Africa. So there's a kind of strong. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. So the the fifth chapter, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Dead Zone, financialized nihilism, toxic wealth, and uh, vindictive technologies. Uh, it examines the dead zones that grow around the world and inside of us under revenge capitalism. It's about the numb but panicked apathy, the overstimulated stagnation and the blinded fixation on survival that sh uh, strips us of our empathy and imagination. And in this, which I, I really enjoyed uh, this chapter, uh, but just pulling bits out, the interlude again, which is really interesting, uh, Chloe Kardashian's revenge body or the Zapatista body, or I think that's I put, The Zapatista nobody, yeah, yeah. Nobody, yeah. Uh, you ask, uh, would a reality show called Avenging, what would a, a reality show called Avenging Body look like rather than fixating on a form of revenge within the moral economy of oppression that caused the injury? So, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of paraphrasing here. So you say a sorry excuse for revenge fantasy, revenge body is one of a wide range of mass produced cultural artifacts that seizes upon the experience of alienation and disposability germane to what I'm calling revenge capitalism and offers an almost narcotic tonic. So for me, there are elements, uh, for me, say that there are elements of psychological torture here where we are in a cultural prison where the spectacle distracts us from ourselves into a nightmarish and dream -like world of looking at other people's lives and not paying attention to our own and collective needs. And so what past, current or future examples uh, that relate to the ideas explored in this text can you share with us regarding uh, or some of the, the context of what we just discussed there? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, um, there's, there's so many things there. So let me preface this by saying, because we're going we're gonna to dive from the, from the discussion of V for Vendetta and, J and Joker uh, into this chapter that I like a big part of the book is exploring the, the vengeance around uh, patriarchy and patriarchal violence. And, and I think any honest accounting for the actually existing revenge politics on the planet needs to take into account that um, like patriarchal revenge by men against women and non-binary people is the reality of revenge politics today. It doesn't necessarily coordinate itself under a particular banner, but you know, uh, men's vengeance is a leading cause of death of women worldwide. So it's important to like frame the, these comments in 
within the context where like murder is happening and, and mass yeah. murder often, especially when we look at some of the things that have been inspired by like what gets called like incel culture, like this stupid internet oh, God, yes. nonsense, yeah. where then men uh, license themselves to take kind of uh, gratuitous and uh, public revenge against women for not finding them attractive because they're mass murderers. I don't know. It, it's an absurd subculture, but one that I think <laughs> is nice for me. Okay. So now coming back to revenge body. So just briefly, like uh, Khloe Kardashian, I, I'm not going to go into the history of the Kardashian family, which are like mega celebrities, basically just because they're, they're famous because they're famous. Um, uh, but this this is a reality TV show uh, aired on MTV, or, or I think maybe not MTV, the reality TV show, Entertainment Network in the United States, um, where Khloe Kardashian basically meets with a person, usually a woman, usually someone who's overweight, and interviews them basically about the traumas of their life. And then they get set up with a personal trainer where for the rest of the episode, they go through usually pretty punishing and brutal personal training, which then usually involves them having some sort of emotional breakdown during the physical training. Um, and all of this is done in the name of taking revenge on somebody who spurned them in the past. So the kind of quintessential example is a woman is dumped by her boyfriend or lover uh, because she's perceived to be too heavy uh, and have the wrong type of body. And so ironically and weirdly, she strives in the show to obtain the body that the, the lover who spurned her would have wanted in order to take revenge on him. Yeah, um, but now she's got it. He can't have it. Is exactly, that kind of, right, right, the right. Revenge. So it's a, I think it's a really toxic um, narrative on multiple levels, and it comes as the latest installation of a number of reality TV shows that have been basically founded in uh, misogyny and fat phobia. Uh, that you know, there's this we as a society, and others have commented on this much more articulately than I can. We have a particular hang-up in this uh, society that we live in about fat, and specifically about fat and gender when put together. Um, and so the film, the, the show, what I found so interesting about it is it offers us, we like on the surface, the, the sort of a manifest narrative of the show is that we're supposed to sympathize with the Avenger in this case that, you know, her, sometimes it's a man, but usually it's a woman, uh, and very occasionally it's a non-binary person. Uh, we're supposed to sympathize with their quest to get revenge and to sympathize with their effort to lose weight and to get the body that they uh, allegedly want. Um, and yet what is so clear about the show, if you mute it and you just watch it, is that this is about spectacularizing the fat body and spectacularizing the, the kind of um, their, their efforts to lose weight. So it's, it's very exploitative, on, especially on a visual level. It's extremely exploitative because you see people really struggling in gym settings to you know, do exercises that are very difficult for them to do. There's a kind of slapstick element to it. Um, and then of course, inevitably the producers of the show try and elicit from the participant a kind of emotional breakdown, which is gonna make for good TV. So it's essentially a kind of revenge against the Avenger through the televisual spectacle that we all participate in and that we sort of uh, enjoy. And I guess in the chapter of this little section of the book, I try and understand what the kind of, what, what uh, Lacanian theorists call like the jouissance, the kind of surplus enjoyment that we get out of this, that the sort of cinematic um, uh, field offers us. And in the chapter, I contrast that to then a very interesting passage from an American uh, group of women who traveled down to Chiapas in uh, what is now Mexico uh, to, to go to the Zapatista gathering of women uh, a few years ago. And the Zapatista vision of what it means to be an embodied Avenger, in my terminology, an embodied Avenger. Um, now, the, the thing I would just say about tying it back to other examples is I think what a reality TV show about avenging rather than revenge would be is we're watching it now. It is happening in the streets of cities around the world as people rise up against uh, what I call revenge capitalism. There was an amazing video um, that was shared yesterday, I believe, of uh, protesters in New Orleans who blocked police cruisers from arresting a black woman at the protest, a young black woman. And they are absolutely, I mean, the police are threatening to drive through the protesters to be able to get the person they've arrested out. The protesters refuse to move. 
and they demand the liberation of this woman who's been captured. She's liberated and there's such uh, an expression of love and joy and care in that moment of all of these bodies of people who don't know each other but share a shared condition. Um, that is the avenging body. It's not just the body of the individual, it's the body of an us. And it's a body okay. of, in, in the terminology of that, of that chapter, it's, a, it's, it's the avenging of all of the nobodies, all of the people who've been made nobody. Yes, so uh, from my own experience at the poll tax riots, we, mm. when we were involved in that, uh, being attacked by police on horses, all kinds of stuff going on, and uh, lots of people were being beaten up and all kinds of damage being caused. Uh, but as a collective, uh, avenging Mar Margaret Thatcher's poll tax at the time, it was an amazing experience and it was very beautiful and mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you rarely feel. It's, uh, it's, something, it's something people try to get at. Uh, I'll say soccer matches for the Americans out there. <laughs> but, and, uh, but football matches here, as we call them, people go to football matches to feel that kind of mass comradeship, but not avenging, I suppose. And, and, that's, that's, and so what you just mentioned there, I can uh, immediately relate to. I just wanted to wind back to the revenge, death and violence aspect when we've... And so, so growing up, we've all grown up with women being kind of attacked in horror films, uh, 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 serial killers attacking them, this kind of archetypal character that, uh, and in detective TV shows, like for years, hundreds and thousands of women being killed, uh, uh, right at the beginning of the show as a kind of plot starter. Uh, which is like so cliche and naff, and and yet the revenge is finding the killer, and uh, but there's there's no real revenge in a sense of dealing with the real context of why do we always have to see loads of women being mutually murdered all the time? Why? Yeah. Why do we have to? Yeah. And it's a it's a very disturbing capitalist control of the idea of women you know we see more women murdered through our psyche and in our dreams possibly uh, than everything else so mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. no it's very true and uh, I'll give a quick content warning here because I have to talk about um, rape and sexual violence um, it, there's been an interesting debate within feminist media studies about the role of this I'm, and, and especially the role of this so-called rape revenge film um, which has become an increasingly common mainstay of, um, of Hollywood in the last uh, few decades, uh, where the theme is that a woman is raped and then uh, comes to take revenge on her rapists. Um, and there's a question that was like the first and in some ways the best book about this by, um, by Clover called Men, Women and Chainsaws makes the point to ask us like, whose fantasy is this? There's a projection to imagine that this is the fantasy of, that we're being led into the fantasy of the woman who takes revenge. But in fact, what this is, is a kind of patriarchal fantasy, where in some way you have the, the image of the vengeful woman who's inevitably and uh, always like, quote unquote, conventionally attractive, and usually scantily clad, and whose horrific sexual assault we've now been made to watch who then comes back to take revenge. And there's a lot to be questioned about who benefits from this. There's also many feminist media scholars who point out that in fact, uh, women and other people who've suffered sexual assault find in these films some form of solace or therapy or vindication. And that may indeed be true, but I think we just need to be very distrustful and always ask the question, who, who mostly benefits here? And um, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, puppet of the female Avenger when in the hands of the marionette uh, master of Hollywood uh, plays a very different role. And, you know, it contrasts, frankly, to the very curious statistic that in spite of the fact that a vast proportion of women in our society, by some conservative estimates, one quarter of women in our society at some point survive sexual assault, 
uh, very few women actually take revenge. Um, and that is that I think we need to hold up beside the um, beside the kind of fantasy of revenge, because I think the fantasy of revenge then furnishes a patriarchal fantasy that women are always seeking revenge. And one of the things I talk about in the book, and I trace back to the uh, to Francis Bacon, the philosopher, not the artist, uh, and the witch trials of the 16th century, is that just as revenge capitalism and the systems of colonialism have always blamed colonized and racialized people for being pathologically and untrustworthily vengeful, so too have they labeled women in society as pathologically vengeful, often in the figure of the witch who needs to be contained and controlled and destroyed. Uh, because if her vengeance is allowed to um, manifest, it will destroy society. And that ties together to the present day use of the, the accusation that white men who dare speak their mind are being, uh, are being caught up in a witch hunt, you know, one of Donald Trump's favorite phases, but also one that is used by practically every right wing and reactionary bigot on the, on the planet now whenever they face any sort of criticism or are told that they don't know what they're talking about, they claim that they're now the victim of a witch hunt, uh, which in some ways is always um, a dog whistle to say that women are out of control. They're out of control in their criticism, they're out of control, even though now the right appropriates the witch hunt as their own language for their own uh, notion of persecution. Yeah, so because they own the system, in so to speak, because its system is designed for their means, they own the idea of objectivity and against the fantasy of hysteria and and potential of revenge. And uh, yes, definitely. Okay, uh, we've discussed a post uh, after the pandemic. I think we've got, yeah, one more question. Uh, so my last question is, uh, what would your ideal or ideal readers take from from this book and how would you expect them to use it beyond reading the book itself yeah oh, it's that's actually a very difficult question for me um because you know as you write a book you have to satisfy the the thing that the book animates within you and then you in some ways just hope that people take some of the similar things I guess one thing I would hope for is that um, fundamentally, we need to do better work of telling stories about how the present came to be that allow us to understand that all of our struggles are connected. Um, and I think in this book, I've struggled to um, balance on the one hand, the rigors of my disciplinary training and cultural studies and critical theory to be able to you know, offer facts and good analysis that are solid and will hold up to criticism. But on the other hand, I want to be a revolutionary storyteller. I want to tell stories that make resistance, rebellion, and revolution irresistible. Um, and for me, that I don't think I've done that, but I, I'm trying to move towards that. And that for me means trying to show that the history of the witch trials, the history of slavery, the history of colonialism, the history of capitalism, the history of uh, gendered exploitation, all of these things are connected on some level. And the thread I use to stitch them together here is revenge, but there are, other, there are many other threads and other people have written excellent books that do similar work in similar ways. So the first and foremost thing I would hope is that it will give us a resource to recognize that all of these stories are connected and that all of our struggles somehow need to connect and that therefore we all need to connect. Those of us who are made disposable by capitalism um, need to connect on some level and work in solidarity. The second thing I would hope that readers would take away from the book in some sense is that um, their efforts to separate uh, like capitalism from racism, colonialism, and imperialism are need to be thrown away. Like that, those things can never be separated. They, they, they are one another's context fundamentally and patriarchy as well. And so I hope to have contributed to the, the realization that we have to keep those things entangled. And I, I regret I didn't do it more in my previous work. The third thing I would say about what I would hope that people would take from the book is that, you know, as we talked about earlier in this interview, um, we live in a society that has surrounded the notion of revenge with a great deal of opprobrium. 
uh, and, and distrust, in spite of the fact that revenge is everywhere and that revenge is a, such a common theme in popular culture as we've discussed, somehow the idea of when you tie revenge to politics, we, we, we have a great allergy and fear of this. And, and not for, like, for good reason, you know, there are, even left-wing and liberatory movements for human liberation have become vengeful and bloody and destructive. I'm not denying that in any, in any way. But I think that we should not deny the way that any thinking, feeling, uh, loving human being feels their blood boil at the incredible injustices that are being perpetuated and the impunity of those who perpetuate those injustices. When we think about the billions who are going to be displaced or die from climate change so that a handful of corporations can continue to make astronomical sums of money. When I think about what happened uh, you know, in the UK context in the Grenville fire, where precarious and disposable people, people who are rendered disposable by the system, were sacrificed on the altar of essentially austerity for no reason. I, I, I can't help but feel vengeful. And I think so many of us encounter things in our, in our life, Grenville Tower Fire a few years ago. Um, I think there are so many examples of that. Um, and I think if we don't deal with that upfront, if we tamp down and push down that notion of vengeance and vengefulness, um, you know, in, some, in, the, in this way, we're doing a great injustice to something that we need to contend with. And I hope to have offered a resource in this book that, to help us think through what it would mean to transform the feeling of vengefulness into a structure of avenging that can be a, a resource for thinking through movements in this moment. Okay, I think that answers that question. So uh, that's it. So again, uh, thank you very much, Max. Thank you so much. And thanks for this opportunity to do the extra, the extra mile. Yes, thank you, Wellington.